Welcome back to the Original Gangsters podcast. I'm here with my partner in crime, Scott Bernstein. Hey now. I'm Jimmy Bucciolato. And if you've been following us on social media, you know that uh, we were looking for a new recording space. And we're happy to say that we're back. And we're here at our old stomping grounds. And those of you that have been listening to us for a long time will remember our original producer, Roberto. Well, we're proud to say that uh, we have a reunion show here. And also in the house with us is Senor Roberto Boshane. Right now. Hey now. <laughs> so, so we're having some fun here. It's like a reunion tour. The yep. original, the three... Three we're, amigos or three stooges, however you want to. <laughs> you know, we, we, they we, made me an offer I couldn't refuse. <laughs> I had to come in. We've been teasing the the move to uh, shooting these things on video and getting them up on YouTube, kind of uh, sooner rather than later. Uh, so this is this is kind of our our new incarnation, and I want right. to shout out to our new producer, uh, Senor Ben Agosta. Thank God for him, <laughs> Benito <laughs> Agosta. Yeah, Benito, see. Si. Uh, what a lifesaver Ben is going to be and has been, and uh, we're very grateful for his uh, participation and joining a, as, a, as a new partner in crime for the OG podcast. That's right. And so we have some older episodes that we were able to record, and some of you know that on YouTube already one of those episodes is up. Hopefully we'll have the rest of those episodes up soon. And then from, from now on, as Scott mentioned, uh, the the regular episodes we record will be on Spotify and, and iTunes, but also on YouTube. Uh, you can watch in video format. Right, we're not going to be getting rid of the audio. Right. That's our you know that right. was our bread and butter. That's what's that's what seeded this whole thing. But I think we're gonna uh, be able to embrace a whole brand new audience, a whole new segment of the of uh, our demographic that maybe has been missing us because we haven't been on video. We haven't been available on all the socials, uh, you know, for video content. So I'm excited to. Uh, you know, find that exposure and maybe find a little bit of a younger audience. Yeah, and we're getting already positive comments. We really haven't plugged it too much because it's only one full episode, but we're getting positive comments already, people saying that it's a breath of fresh air. And I take that as a compliment. I mean, I, I think, if I may be so bold, we have a more serious, uh, if that's the word, <laughs> I hate to sound like a snob, but uh, you have, uh, we're not just two like uh, jabronis <laughs> who have a video show talking about mobsters that, you know, we've put a lot of time and effort training to, to develop yeah, our expertise. I think our, not that we know everything, but I think we know a lot. And our perspective and, you know, how we storytell, I think, is a lot different than a lot of the other um, kind of self proclaimed mob Those tubers. Are um out there which are you know a lot of them are just recycling a lot of the same old stories and whatnot and i think we we take pride in uh being the the type of podcast that comes out and, and hits it from all different kind of angles a lot of nuance a lot of context right and a lot of history that ties into pop culture and crime and telling you like the real story behind goodfellas the real story behind casino T today we're going to talk about the show the offer on paramount Right. And kind Speaking of, of good fellows, we have another special guest. Oh, in the Rico, Senior Rico, Rico Beard Rico came here. in to join us. It's, it just is, to say hi. It is fun to be back in this studio because we have all sorts of special guests. Yeah. <laughs> Celebrity the man, the that, myth, the legend from East Lansing. You don't have any extra mics. <laughs> <laughs> sure we do. <laughs> but uh, we're um, we're excited to dive in today. We're gonna you know start with a kind of a local angle. Um, for an unsolved murder case that uh, has uh, popped up on, on the uh, pop culture radar as well as the crime radar here in Detroit the last month. Um, very tragic. I think the term tragic gets thrown around way too often, but uh, thanks, sir. Thank you. I'll be listening. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Thank you. But uh, shout out to Rico Beard. Um, 97.1, uh, the ticket, he co-hosts co uh, with Mike Valeni in the, in the afternoon uh, for any sports fans. In check it area, out. Yeah, they know who he is. So uh, Dan uh, Hutch, the jeweler Hutchinson, 47-year-old uh, uh, proprietor of uh, Hutch's Jewelry Store on Greenfield in Oak Park, Michigan, right, uh, you know, a stone's throw away from the Detroit city limits. And uh, he was gunned down in a contract hit. Uh, earlier this month uh, in front of a pawn shop that he had just bought uh, down the street from his trademark, you know, flagship jewelry store. And he's, you know, he wasn't just an ordinary, any run of the mill jeweler. Um, he was the 
the Iceman to the stars uh, here in Detroit you know, for the last d- decade, two decades. Uh, and even as a national client, yeah, show, right? Yeah, I'm saying a- any uh, rapper, athlete that was coming into Detroit for an extended period of time or just vacationing that wanted to check out the, the jewelry selection in town, they'd make a stop at Hutch's. Uh, you know, was famous for for his custom made buffs, which are the you know another city trademark for Detroit Cartier glasses, and uh, his Detroit. I think dime- Roberto has a pair of <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Di- yeah, in ninety seven. <laughs> the diamond encrusted uh, in old English D. Yeah, uh, so he was kind of like chains. He, he was, was kind of like for. Adam Sandler in Uncut Gems. Yeah, I but. think that that. Uh, without the degenerate <laughs> gambler right, I wanna, part, yeah, I uh, gangster part, yeah, because I've never heard that Dan Hutchinson anything but being a stand-up citizen and uh, a great guy and someone that everybody loved, which is adding, you know, fuel to the fire in terms of people scratching their head and where did this come from and why did it happen? Did people name check him in songs too? Is that or just, um, just people on the? Scene I wish or... I had a, a a better knowledge of uh, but Detroit underground hip hop today. We're here. I mean, I, yes. I know the I know the the main players and I know some of their music, but yeah. I don't know it well enough to, sure. to know about the the name checks. But I know that he was a a, a favorite of Rick Ross's, mm. uh, the yeah. Miami DJ who came in Detroit a lot. Um, and back in 2019, he started to use his social media, Rick Ross's social media, uh, Rick Ross used his social media to shout out, uh, Hutch and, and the stuff that he would come to Detroit and buy, and then he'd display it on, on all of his socials. Um, but there was just an outpouring of, um, condolences on social media by all of the, you know, the Royal the Detroit hip hop royalty. Mm-hmm. Uh, pay, payroll Giovanni, oh, I yeah. swear Vezo, I like, I like, yeah, I like some uh, of that stuff. You know, Babyface Ray, Forty Two Doug, all the hottest young names right now. Um, cash, Cash Boys, uh, Cash Out Doughboys. Yeah, um, that's so, Payroll Giovanni's uh, group. Yeah, uh, so you know, Payroll uh, had a. Had we a, want uh, him on our show one one yeah. of these days. We'd like to. Yeah, no, I, I, and I'm a, I'm a big fan of his. I've got a chance to meet him a couple times, and I know he likes what we do. Uh, so yeah, let's try to make that happen. But payroll uh, was very, uh, I don't want to say animated, but was uh, in his in his posts on social media, he told like a story, uh, like through a, through I think a couple threads um, on on his Twitter about how growing up in Detroit, and, and he's this shows you how young he is, but you know, growing up in Detroit, uh, before he ever had money to go spend on jewelry, he aspired to get that first paycheck and take it to, to Hutch and, yeah. and buy his first chain. And I think he talks about going there after paydays before he got his deal and you know, scrapping enough money together to just buy something small. And then by the time he got his his payday from, I think that you think I think he was on Def Jam. I think he's on Def Jam. Um, he went and bought a hundred thousand dollar piece from uh, from Hutch, and he, and he said in the thing is that, and it's what's funny about that is that I don't wear it that much. I just take it out for special occasions. Yeah. But how important and um, kind of, kind of uh, life critical for him that purchase was. How it to him it it, it symbolized him making it, and how Hutch was like that write a passage for any Detroit hip hop or her athlete that was making a lot of money. One of the first stops you made after cashing that check was with Hutch. Yeah. So, so for him to turn up dead in a gangland style hit, it's pretty big deal, not only around here, but as you point out throughout the hip hop community. So what do we know about like the details of like that day? Like what, what well, happened? What we know right now, we're three weeks removed from it is there are, a lot of maneuverings behind the scenes, a lot of subterfuge, I believe, uh, by the and evasiveness by law enforcement in discussing this with the media. And frankly, the media is not being very aggressive in their reporting. Um, I uh, probably reported the the most um, accurate account of what happened on that day, and I, I'm. And my reporting calls into question what's going on with the investigation. Uh, So uh, I believe 72 hours after Hutch was gunned down, uh, the Oak Park police arraigned a 
45 year old man uh, named Leroy Larry, who uh, I've been recently told goes by the street name uh, Precious Roy uh, and uh, has somewhat of a reputation on, on uh, the streets of Detroit. And uh, he was charged with first degree uh, murder and uh, he was allegedly detained uh, near the scene of, of the crime, which again took place on Greenfield, uh, I believe in between uh, eight and nine. Mile Road, and uh, it, but it seems like there's a lot more than that meets. There's a lot more at play than meets the eye right now because I talked to people that were eyewitnesses to the crime itself, multiple people, and they say that Roy Larry did not pull the trigger. Um, Roy, on his car, right? What? Roy Larry, from what I was told, was in a car in the parking lot of the pawn shop. Now, I don't know. I'm not saying that Roy Larry is innocent in the Hutchinson murder conspiracy. He very well might have been involved in stalking and carrying out a murder contract on Dan Hutchinson. But I've been told, again, by multiple people that were eyewitnesses that the shooter, despite what Oak Park Police is telling you right now and the Oakland County prosecutor, which is telling you that Roy Larry was the shooter and he was a one-man one man band, uh, I've been told, again, by two, by two people that were on the scene, as well as other people that have confirmed this from other sources, that there was the, the actual trigger man uh, was a uh, light skinned African American in his early 20s to mid 20s that was on a bicycle. And that he was actually uh, run over at the scene after he, he shot Hutchinson dead um, and was taken to the hospital. Uh, went into surgery and was uh, arrested at the hospital. The police aren't admitting this. They're not confirming it nor denying it. Run over by... By a, another person that was in the parking lot that's, that, that was trying to, I think, stop him. I, I, okay, that's what I was getting, running. Yeah. yeah. So, so Hutch, just the details, like he was shot in his car? No, so Hutch was at the pawn shop. He had purchased his pawn shop a couple uh, weeks before, at some point in the, in the spring of 22, um, and there is some belief, uh, we'll, we'll go through the theories in a second, uh, but he was at this pawn shop with his wife and uh, went into the pawn shop, came out of the pawn shop, got into his GMC Denali, um, was backing out of the, of the parking space to go drive back on to Greenfield Road. And someone came up to him and unloaded an automatic weapon in his window and uh, fully, he, auto, fully automatic. Yeah, it was I think semi so, semi automatic. Okay. Yeah, uh, but but hit him uh, at least half a dozen times, killing him instantly. Jeez. Uh, his wife was right next to him, had her had his brain splattered in her lap. Gosh. Uh, so just very gruesome, uh, very visceral, and frankly, this kind of stuff. I mean, murders happen every day, but of, of this this was a regular civilian um, that was not involved, at least. What we know now was not involved in any criminal activity. What time of day was this? Uh, this was in the early afternoon. Oh, so broad daylight. Yeah. Very conspicuous. Yeah. High so, profile target, middle of the day. So this is... And there was no robbery. Yeah, no robbery. Yeah. Uh, so, so, a, so this is absolutely hit. a contract hit. Yeah. I mean, how could it not be? Right. So I've been, uh, been able to run down two theories, and I'll throw them both out there. Uh, one is that the... Federal government in Southeast Michigan over the last year to two years have been exploring uh, angles of, of narcotic, narcotic trafficking money laundering operations that are going through jewelry stores. I'm not saying that Hutch is one of the jewelry stores that they were investigating, but I was told that there were rumors circulating on the street that Hutch, because he was such a big name in the jewelry in industry, was being pressed or squeezed or pressured by law enforcement to tell what he knew about uh, drug dealers using jewelry stores to launder money. And uh, that is possibly what got him murdered. Uh, you know, the most famous drug dealing case in American history, which dates back to Detroit in 2005, the Motor City Mafia bust brought down the Black Mafia family, uh, which is now a, a hit show on stars. Um, there was a, a Jacob the Jeweler, who, if people are fans of 
hip hop of the late nineties to the two thousands. He got name checked all the time, and he was the druid of the stars in Manhattan, and he was helping the Flannery brothers. Uh, Big Meech and Terry uh, launder drug money, and he ended up having to go to prison. There's a uh, there's a really cool video on YouTube. I don't know if you've seen it. It's it, it's it's in a series. It's like a nine part series. The last days of Rockefeller. Yeah, you ever see, they're in downtown Philadelphia, and Dame Dash goes into the jewelry store, and the guy is selling a Rockefeller chain with the logo on it. That those are only meant for artists, you know what right. I mean? Like, the, and this this guy seemed to maybe have bought it or replicated it, and Damon Dash himself went into the store, took it, and left without paying for it. <laughs> he <laughs> said, what are you going to do about that's it? That's a business where there's a lot of cash <laughs> yeah. exchanging hands. Um, and then you as the jeweler have to make, you know, uh, report who's paying for what, you know, with with how that payment is being made with, with Jacob, the jeweler, he was helping them launder money by fudging the numbers on the, the documents that he was filing with the government and returns to the, pur- in regards to the purchases. Remember so, the, uh, uh, death row chains were only for death row guys. Yeah. And that was a lot of currency for the Crips. If you could yeah. snatch, if you right. could jump one of the death row guys and snatch one of the and and uh, because they that, were a, there was a blood outfit despite and, the fact that Snoop was involved right there was a so there was that that went down not long before Tupac was killed and I yeah. think there was a well that's what they, ha- they jumped that's one what of those happened bloods that guys. was the the fight that everyone yes. talks about in yeah, the casino right. that night with Baby Lane Anderson yeah we're not right, we're right. going all over the place we're talking right, about yeah. Tupac's murder back in ninety six but well, yeah you know, and then they said that like allegedly. Baby Lane had stolen Puffy, a death row. Puffy had put it out there. Oh, to, yeah, snatch to, a chain. To, right. You bring me one of those chains, and yeah. I'll give you 25 grand. And Baby Lane had was. snatched a chain a couple days before the Selden Tyson fight. And then uh, Tupac is told while they're at the casino for this Tyson Selden fight, oh, Baby Lane's here. Yeah. And they there was a brawl in the casino I that, think that preceded yeah, Tupac's murder. I think that Jacob the jeweler was also named in the um, Murder, Inc., yeah, thing with that I with the Gotti too, brothers with with, and, uh, with Irv Gotti yeah, and then Kenny Supreme McGriff, yeah. one of the more uh, most notorious uh, dope boys in in New York history. So um, right now, uh, you know, I'll talk about you know specifically my reporting on this. My I wrote it for Deadline Detroit, um, and and it got a, a really big reaction. And my editors were worried that we were going to get a ton of blowback from the Oak Park Police Department because we were throwing shade in their direction and not a peep. So, uh, you know, when you don't hear from anyone, uh, it, to me, it tells you that you're, you've, you've caught some, some tailwind of the truth at the very least. Yeah. Um, and I, I wouldn't have reported that, uh, questioning the, the police, uh, the, the law enforcement's order of operation if I didn't have it on really good, um, you know, my sources were really solid here. And, uh, I, I think they're very well could be non-malicious intentions behind what the police are doing behind the scenes in, in terms of they have a shooter. They're telling the media that there's another shooter. Possibly they're trying to squeeze the real shooter for information on who gave him mm-hmm. the contract. Yeah. Um, and they're trying to keep that quiet. And I blew the lid on it. I don't know. I just know that I heard that there was a different shooter. Roy Larry or precious Roy Larry is a dark skinned 45 year old man. Um, and who's been charged as the shooter, but I'm being told the shooter was a light skinned 20 year old man on a bicycle. And that that man on the bicycle is in custody. So it's not like I'm being told that, that, that there's a, a trigger man that's on the loose. Right. I'm told that they have the trigger man. They're just not charging him as such. They're charging precious Roy as the trigger man, whether they know that he is or possibly that he isn't. And again, they're playing some type of good cop, bad cop game behind the scenes. What's another, are there any other theories other than the, so the other theory that I was able to run down, um, and there are some people very close to Hutch that are, I don't want to say adamant, but feel very strongly that this is a possibility. And, uh, uh, who am I to tell them they're wrong? Because it's definitely something that, that is possible and plausible. And I wrote about is that his purchase of the pawn shop 
uh, had something to do with this. Hmm. Um, that he had purchased the pawn shop, you know, the previous couple weeks, and possibly there was something going down with the with the business transaction that led. I, I don't know, but wow. I heard that from two people that were uh, very close to the to, to the Hutchinson family orbit. Are the feds getting involved in this at all? I don't know Do that either. Go because they want Oak Park. Yeah. Not. So, mom is the word from law enforcement, and, and, and frankly, again, I'm not here to call out members of the media here in Detroit, but you know, there hasn't been any reporting on this either outside of my. In some reporting. ways, it seems like it's got, other than your reporting, it seems like it, it got more national attention yeah. than, than right. even right here locally. You'd think that is, the free weird. press and the news, the very least, would be jumping all over this thing, um, running down different angles, writing different stories. There isn't, you know, I'm trying to write something over this next week or two uh, about Hutch the Man. And, you know, because like he was a beloved figure in this community. I knew a number, of, I didn't know him personally. I, I know a number of people that knew him very well, and they're all just, uh, grief stricken and and you know shook to the core. Yeah, by know this. him? Um, no, but uh, uh, it doesn't matter. I just want. I know Al is upset. Some uh, members of the Hutchinson family. Oh, this some of the, some of Al's comments afterwards, and it's none of my business. Okay, but uh, Al was implying some of what I'm saying, but maybe less judiciously. <laughs> Okay. With uh, less diplomatic, uh, what Al was saying was basically: tact. if you're a drug dealer, stay away from jewelers. Oh, because jewelers are are perceived weak links from law enforcement because they're not gangsters, right? And they're handling a lot of gangsters' money. Yeah, and that the second that a jeweler gets in trouble, whether it be for money laundering or whatever, that he could be quick to flip on a yeah. On Remember, a, there on was Don the jeweler. Right. That's Donnie Brasco. <laughs> oh, yeah. Joe Pistone. And I don't know if Roberto even knows about our little uh, OG uh, podcast beef with uh, Mr. Pistone. I, I was oh, texting no. some. Yeah, I want to get Pistone on the show, but Bernie doesn't like oh, him. Oh, my God. <laughs> Bernie oh, refused. No. Donnie Brasco called me I last year <laughs> and chastised me for misinterpreting the Donnie Brasco investigation. Which we didn't. When he <laughs> obviously did not. Right. Listen to the episode, which we say what he was, you know, having his meltdown about. We address literally in the first five seconds where we say that the interview subject, Richie Cantarella, was not arrested in the Donnie Brasco case, but was well acquainted with everybody yes. that was arrested in the Donnie Brasco case <laughs> and made his bones as a mobster by killing Tony Mira, who was the person that introduced Donnie Brasco to the entire Bonanno yeah. crime family, right. who was his uncle. Right. So um, we use, we, to promote the episode, check it out in our archives. It's actually in our top 10 downloads, the interview with um, Richie Cantarella, Shellackhead. Um, we used the, the images of the Donnie Brasco movie and we said, if to, you want to, know to promote the real, it. And if we said, if you want to know the real story <laughs> yeah. behind Donnie Brasco, which that, that, Podcast does give you a lot of insight yeah, on the yeah, real story right. behind those that's guys. Right. But he took exception to it, and but... uh, he got my number from somebody and and left me this <laughs> this message uh, without letting me have an opportunity to respond to him. Wouldn't give me a, a a number to call him back at. When I reached out to him through the person that gave him my phone number, wouldn't allow that person to give me his his <laughs> phone number. Um, and I was just like, wow. Like, well, ho hopefully he'll, <laughs> well, like, hopefully he'll come on and we can clear it up. So, uh, that I, again, I digress, but, uh, <laughs> I, I will be putting something out in the next week or two, uh, celebrating, uh, Dan Hutchinson, the man, He's 47 years old, yeah, it's uh, tragic. his widow was named Marissa and, uh, he grew up, I believe in Livonia, but don't quote me on that. I know his family started the, the, the jewelry, uh, store chain uh, in Northland, I believe in 1990 or 91. And then uh, uh, when Northland shut down, uh, they moved to a, a freestanding location on Greenfield down the street from where Northland used to be. Northland was, a, for, for people that aren't from Detroit, Northland Mall was a, a kind of a hot spot destination for a long time. That was the first big shopping mall. It was the first big mall shopping in mall in area. Metro Detroit. Right. Actually, even, even nationally, it was yeah, one yeah, of the first. In the country. Yeah, yeah my, it was, my, it was uncle, a big deal. my uncle Jack had. Uh, was was in early on the uh, 
shopping mall front. And I, I heard stories about the grand opening of Northland. My parents were at, or not my parents, my mom and her family were all at the grand opening because yeah. of my uncle Jack's involvement in, in, in the development of, of, uh, yeah, of the shopping deal. malls. But uh, yeah, so Northland. And then by the, uh, you know, the eighties and nineties, the Northland became a, <laughs> a well, uh, treaded stomping ground for a lot of the biggest uh, dope boys in Detroit that would come out to, to Northland and, and do their shopping. And uh, I know uh, Eddie Money, a.k.a. Black Ed, a.k.a. Big Ed Hansard, who I'm hoping we'll have on the show at some point. Uh, he spent his last days of his last, I should say, his last hours of freedom at Northland Mall shopping. And when he was headed out to his uh, candy apple red Benz was uh, arrested by the uh, FBI and, and didn't see freedom for another 30 years. And uh, Demetrius Holloway, uh, the, the Detroit drug don of drug dons in the 1980s, had his headquarters at the, or one of his headquarters was the Sports Jam, which was a uh, apparel and shoe, shoe shop uh, that was in Northland as well as in a strip mall right outside of Northland. And uh, the, the rumor was that at around the time of his death in 1990, that sports jams were, were getting so big that he was on the verge of selling out to Foot Locker. I don't know if that's true or if that's just street myth. But What's that, the, What was the big uh, clothing store that he was killed um, downtown? Oh, he was, he was killed at the Broadway. Broadway, right. Demetrius Holloway right. in 1990. Which is by Greektown, right, right outside of Greektown. Right, right. Um, well, anyhow, let's, uh, we were talking about Donnie Brasco. Let's, let's transition, spend the rest of the episode talking about some other popular culture depictions of, uh, or movies, television shows about the mafia. Uh, well, I know, specifically Roberto wanted to talk yeah, about he, the He's offer. got something on his mind. So what, what, what's uh, going on with I, that? Yeah, I was just making some notes here. I mean, I, I wanted to ask you guys. So we'll just, I, let, we'll just give people a little bit of a primer. It's the 50 year the, anniversary of The Godfather it came out in 1972. Uh, there's been a lot of you know, uh, pomp and circumstance around s celebrating that. Uh, part of that was the, the Paramount Network, which is, uh, you know, the which birth is great. from birth from the Paramount Studio. Highly recommend it. Uh, decided a couple years ago to develop a ten-part TV mini miniseries, not about the movie The Godfather, but the making of the movie, right? The Godfather, actors. the behind the scenes right. of how that movie got made. Yeah. Um, so a live action, want, not a right, documentary. Right. But and they like wanted to roll action. it out this the, the summer of of uh, of twenty two, which is the fifty year anniversary. Uh, stars Miles Teller, um, who's one of my favorite actors, uh, modern day uh, leading men. And, who does he uh, play? Great. He Al plays Ruddy. Al Ruddy, who was the oh. producer who uh, really fought a yeah, uh, fought a war to get I mean, that movie really, made. Really, I mean, when you watch that show, you really see that just the constant. Struggle and battle. It was an uphill battle that, to get that, that movie the, made the, for every, a lot for a lot of reasons. Yeah, everything that the studio wanted to do was wrong. Yeah, I mean, and I'm not talking about like five things. There was like 25 things yeah. that they would have done that would have affected the you know the classic. Well, what start that with movie the, let's, just, let's start with Robert the fact Redford that they wanted Robert <laughs> yes, Redford to play Michael still. Corleone. <laughs> That could be the single worst <laughs> the least casting Italian idea guy. I've <laughs> ever heard. The least Italian Italian guy wanted ever. It, they wanted it to be modern day in the 70s in Kansas City shot in. <laughs> right. I mean, it's ridiculous. Um, so I, And then know, remember the, the scene with the posters. They're doing the, the, the posters for the movie. It were just god awful. Everything they did was wrong. Well, there, And there, this guy stuck to his guns at ever. I mean, he moved heaven and earth to, to do all the things. I mean, Coppola... Was about to get fired at any minute, you know. Um, and by the way, let me say this: the guy that plays Coppola is so spot on. Is it Dan? Is it Dan? Is it is it Dan Fogler? I don't know. I don't know what his name is, but he is like the casting of this show was so cool. Is man. it Dan Fogler? Look, I'm looking up uh, Dan Fogler. Yeah, yeah, I like Dan Fogler a lot. I actually, um, man, he was. Good. I've been, you know, and I should say, I was about to say, I've been pushing for him to play in my mind, not to anybody that <laughs> listens. <laughs> But, you know, I've always thought he'd be a great uh, Sam Kinison. Oh, um, yeah. he, you know, uh, Fogler was, uh, again, I'm big digression here, but uh, the movie Fanboys, which is about. Uh, I don't know if I'm uh, familiar with that. It was a early uh, Seth Rogen uh, from that crew. Uh, Kristen Bell from Detroit was in it. It was about a bunch of, of friends in the late 90s that wanted to go see the the new Star Wars together. And I don't, one never of their heard, friends was not. No, I, I never I, heard of I'd him. I'd like to see And that. Dan Fogler's actually one of the stars of that movie, and he's hilarious. He's hilarious in um, 
Uh, I'm looking at his bio with now. Uh, the movie with Topher Grace and, and Anna Ferris, where she met Chris Pratt. Um, Take me home tonight. He's really funny in. And I'll say it's 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 not just the casting of that guy playing Coppola, but also the guy that they got to play Al Pacino is just so because I, when I first started watching the show, that was the big question: was are they going to show the Al actual- Pacino and Marlon Brando yeah. and James Caan and Duvall and these guys? Right. So. I was really worried. I was like, this could turn lame really quick if they don't do their homework on the casting, right? So, but they hit it out of the park, as far as I'm concerned. Even the guy that played Brando, it was so cool because a lot of people don't know. We know because we know the history of it. But a lot of people know that like Brando, Brando was, on, Brando Brando was career, like 40 years old. And his career and his career at that time was was in the gutter. Yeah, but he was still a young guy. Right. No no studio would touch him right. at that point. No. Uh and he had to screen test. <laughs> yeah, can you imagine? Right. Um, but you know, Roberto and I were talking off mic um, that I want to kind of get into, and I, I made an analogy to the offer to the HBO show that's come out recently called Winning Time, um, which is all about the the Lakers dynasty in the 1980s. Which I also loved. And it's, uh, the, well, I'll, I'll talk specifically for a second about Winning Time, which is based on the book Showtime, which is one of my all-time favorite uh, true right. sports or true sports well sports books <laughs> uh true crime true sports uh just a uh, jeff perlman is one of my all-time favorite authors of any genre He's, and I've, I've talked to you know mike valenti and rico beard on these things and i you know i've questioned them about things and you know yeah you do have to suspend disbelief yeah and uh but and, and the show does the show has a huge disclaimer at the, t- yeah. at the front of the show but okay <laughs> but but here's what i'll say about both of these artistic endeavors um, I, I don't feel right if I am either Al Ruddy and I'm behind this or if I'm behind the, the, uh, Paramount offer show, <laughs> or if I'm Jeff Perlman and, and, uh, uh, Adam McKay, who is behind winning time. I, I don't, I would not feel right about doing those stories without talking to the principals and mm. without using at least a portion of the principal's insight in crafting the story. Well, and that's I, the thing. The only the only guy that can corroborate anything in the offer is Al Ruddy. Well, well so if he I, but says I'm, it happened, you have to believe. No, that. I've no. no, but I'm saying you you shouldn't believe. Oh, that. I've <laughs> I've talked to a, a number of people since the show came out, and I've read a number of things from the principals that are saying, no, no, this is Al Ruddy's uh, recollections and anecdotes, and a lot of this, uh, uh, you know, again, creative license and and liberties that are are taken by the by the filmmakers, or in this case, the the, the screenwriters and and, te- and television showrunner, but. Uh, I don't think it's wrong to take something, take you know, take a seed or a kernel of truth, and then fictionalize around it. As a general rule, I don't think that there's anything wrong no. with that. But if you completely lose context, I think it's dangerous. Uh, I mean, we can go back to white the, boy the, Rick. I, to the or White Boy Rick the movie, <laughs> right. The Irishman oh, on yeah. Netflix. Yeah, yeah. When when things are are intentionally shaded away from true context, it just becomes a slippery slope because I mean, so much of what people believe is taken from the movies, television, oh, yeah. music that people do you uh, believe, consume. And, and if it's not, so what I was going to say about both of those in both of those situations. Uh, but if we're talking about the offer, I'll, I'll tell you my bit. And, and okay, a disclaimer on on my end: I have not watched all the way through either one of those shows, but I have consumed oh, enough of both of those shows to feel like I can speak uh, with a level of intelligence on the show. And I've I've read a lot about uh, you know the the um, backlash and the the story behind the story. So with the offer, you know, the, again, this is. The, 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 the people that make the show decided for dramatic purposes, it would be better for the audience to think that the mafia was uh, in, on a, in a full scale war well, that's what with I the, ask with you the production, the producers of that movie right. and, and unleashing a, uh, a, a campaign of, of intimidation. How many? And that's not, that's just not true. <laughs> the mafia in New York. Yes. But they, will, they were they, involved. They wove a great tale. I the mafia in New York. Yes. They were involved in the production of the Godfather. That's undisputed. They were not 
upset about the fact that the Godfather was being made. They wanted control over how the story the Godfather was being told. Now are There's those, a difference. Okay, and nobody those, was getting phone calls in the middle of the night told uh, they were going to be sleeping with the fishes well, have, if, <laughs> the, if the production I have, continues. I have some questions, though. So you tell me what's true or untrue about some of these things in the show. How many times, if one or none, did Al Ruddy be in the same room with Joe Colombo? I think that part is actually true. Columbo was the point man. Columbo and Ruddy had a relationship. Mm -hmm. I think I've seen, I saw in some of the episodes they were peppering in Carlo Gambino yes. and Tommy Lucchese. Yes. I, I don't necessarily think. I know. That's what my, that my understanding right. is it was, it was just Columbo. Yeah. And, the, you know, again, something that is not disputed. You know, if you watch the Godfather movies, the word mafia is not used. Right. And no, you, I have that in my notes here too. Right. That 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 is very I just always thought that that was like a clever thing, but I didn't know that that was actually what, like a It was a clever thing. Know. It was a clever thing that the production had to figure out because <laughs> right, Joe Colombo was saying, yeah. I'm not going to be cool with you making this movie if you don't do it this way, that way, so and that's the other. true. Right. And he had leverage because of the the Teamsters union. The right. unions that, shut down production. Right. Uh, and the neighborhood, they control those neighborhoods. But I I just just like with Winning Time, where there was a lot of narratives that were just very one-dimensional. Well, yeah, and, Winning Time, seems like the, the timeline gets very distorted in Winning yeah. Time from what I've, I've been with, told. With this, I mean, I'm watching some of this and, like, Robert Evans gets a call in the middle of the night and is like, if you don't stop production now, you, your wife right. and your he kids He probably are had nine trouble. other movies in production. Right. And, and, and it's like, that never happened. The Mafia was not... The Mafia wanted this movie made. The Mafia loved the book The Godfather. Now, this, now this though, I thought was... Um, but they wanted it made in a certain way that they didn't feel was because no one generalizing or inauthentic or yeah. you know a, a, as I think this has been said ad nauseum when people have talked about the movies with with, with or talked about that movie uh, whether it be Coppola or Robert Evans or Puzo that all of the Italian mob movies up until that point. You had Jewish actors playing the Italian mobster. <laughs> yeah, that was the, yeah, that was yeah. the whole deal. Yeah. <laughs> and, and which you do a little bit in James Conn. I mean, you know, you know, James Conn, one of my favorite quotes from him, though, is uh, I've won Italian American of the Year twice. <laughs> I'm not even Italian. I'm Jewish. I mean, it's like because <laughs> everyone thinks but those Italian. But, but what, what, what wasn't bullshit is that the mafia had a presence, not just behind the camera with decisions on what was going in and out of the script, but the mob was there. Now, do you was yeah. that was on set? Was it true that they that in the show? I don't want to spoil this for anybody. But whatever, spoiler alert! Turn this off. But um, there was a private screening in New York. Yes, well, for the mafia. No, the, well, this this was something that I know was true, and it caused a lot of consternation um, in the you know with the suits. Was that Ruddy had made this deal with Colombo and the Italian American Association, where Without putting it in a contract, for all intents and purposes, he gave them final cut. Mm -hmm. So he promised them that they could watch the cut of the movie before the studio and could make changes, oh <laughs> you know, at will. I mean, I think that might be a little bit of an exaggeration, but yeah. something along those lines. And I know that uh, Charles Boothorn, who was the uh, the chairman of the board Golf for, and for, for, uh, for, for the people that own Paramount, uh, lost his mind when, when he heard that uh, there was going to have to be some uh, pass muster with, with the Italian-American Association in New York. Was, would there ever been, because this was in the show, would there ever been a face-to-face -face meeting with Al Ruddy and Joey Gallo? No. <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't think Gallo had, would have had any. Gallo, I guess Gallo was alive. That's where the timeline I guess Gallo was alive from. when... Uh, the movie was being shot. No, well, he was because he, he had murdered. Columbo killed, right? Uh, in seventy two. Well, but was paralyzed. it Columbo killed? Well, and Nikki Barnes and Nikki Barnes is, is depicted. He wasn't killed though. He was in the, he was in, paralyzed. Well, he you know what? I, I'm sorry. Yeah, though, so. you know that's right. He was. He did. Yeah, he was. But Which he was, I didn't know until I did. Yeah, he was, he was alive for like seven for years. Like seven years. No. Um. But uh, and and you know Scott and I are like you know movie buffs sticklers and um but up until up until the godfather and and there's some fun gangster films in the in the in the all the way from the 30s to the to the 60s 
I'm fond of a lot of these films, but for the most part, like Italian mafiosi in these movies are like cartoonish. Right. I mean, you think of like Jason Robards as like Al, Al Capone, Al Capone. <laughs> in the nineteen sixty seven scene. Which, like, which is a really fun movie. I really enjoy that movie. Like Roger Kelly Corman. Savalas. It's a fun it's a but it's like it's very cartoonish. It's like the Dick Tracy kind of yeah. <laughs> mobsters. Or so, Kirk Douglas. Yeah, right. Kirk Douglas. Right. So The Godfather was really it really was the first authentic it was, it was uh, transforma- depiction. It was transformational. Yeah. I mean, it, 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 it time, you know, sometimes it, it comes down to perfect place, perfect time, perfect material. Yeah. But as Robbie points out, and, and if you know the story and if you watch the, the doc, which is, or not the doc, if you watch the scripted 10 part uh, series on, uh, on, on Paramount, <laughs> for the movie that's generally considered by a lot of people, uh, m- maybe aside from Gone with the Wind or, or yeah. uh, Citizen Kane, right. the greatest movie of all time, um, there were, Quite a bit of uh, quite a few hurdles, um, in the sense that the studio, like like Robbie said, it went well. It, and also, I think there's again some context here. The studio went from not really caring much about it because the book hadn't been released yet. Right. They made a deal with Puzo, uh, Ruddy, and I think Evans saw the value in it, but the the suits were not enthralled until. The book hit the market and became a New York Times bestseller. Right. Then all of a sudden, the 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 brass at Paramount get involved, and it becomes too many cooks in the kitchen. Yeah. And my my understanding is that that at that because of some of what I'm talking about, that they considered that a dead genre. They yeah. were like that the 30s. That was the high point of gangster films, and and everything from the 40s, 50s, and 60s really and, did, really wasn't received very well. Other than probably Bonnie and Clyde, if you if you want to consider that a gangster film, well, or that was, was it. you could seven. actually trace back the which the is a new, great the, film, the, the new way. era gangster yeah. movie, the birth of it. You I, could trace I, back I to sixty seven well, with yeah. Bonnie and Clyde. Uh, no, I they agree. Said too that Cop- yeah. Coppola was thirty one when he directed The Godfather, and what he said was. Yeah, he was hired before the book was released. The book became a New York Times bestseller. They wanted he, to get rid said, of him. Yeah, he said that the the book had outclassed him. <laughs> no, the, stu- <laughs> they, if, the if the book would have if they knew the book was a hit, they, yeah, they never would have hired right. him. The studio was him. and once the book became a hit, the studio was trying to get him out. Right. They wanted to And they didn't want profile. Pacino because Pacino was a guy, nobody. They, they had didn't a guy think Pacino was, they didn't was good. Didn't they, they didn't think Pacino yeah. was good looking we're, enough. We're, they didn't think he was tall enough. Right. Which is funny. They thought he was too ethnic looking, but it's like it's a movie about yeah. Sicilian. Well, they say that you <laughs> what know, do you, in, what in, in some of the scenes of the show <laughs> where they expect them to look the, like? The, like the first scenes that Pacino shot for the movie, a lot of the, the studio heads are there and they're like, oh my God, this is awful. Look at this guy. He's shrimp. He's short. But even even Coppola concedes that 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 Al Pacino's tests were not very we're right. not very good, right? But he, but he just he visual- worked it out. He worked it out. He visualized. He's like, I, I'm, I know this guy can do it, even if. <laughs> and so you know, talking like about authenticity, let me just throw one thing out. Talking for authenticity, James Khan might have been Jewish, but there's he's the best. So James Khan is as Italian as any actor that's ever played an Italian. <laughs> no, he is, and is his mob no, connected? No, as, and, that's true. Yeah, yeah. he was that's best true. man at Mush Russo's wedding. Well, yeah. Mush Russo, who just died, by the way, in the last couple months, right, was Columbo one of the boss. last New York Godfathers, uh, and ran the Colombo crime family as a as a quote unquote street boss, acting boss since the nineties. And uh, he just passed away, was under indictment. And this guy was as big as you get in the New York Mafia. And this was Jimmy, Con- t- you know, till he died uh, in 2022. Yeah. This was Jimmy Conn's best friend. They oh, caught speaking- him surveillance. Right. Then they- he was- There's a famous the picture of him yeah. walking out of the wedding right. with Mush Russo. <laughs> speaking of that, the one other question I had for you. Andy Mush. Was uh, in the offer, I was, I was surprised to see this, but I'm glad they did it, was they actually had a character that played Gianni Russo. Russo. <laughs> who who was and, that's another and, one of Scott's and, and, buddies, and they made him look like the biggest scumbag in this show. Well, that was Why a, do you think they did that? Was that Al Ruddy? Uh, well, saying that I, he again, was a scumbag? this is this is not. Oh, is I think it, is this is true? not mythology. I think what is <laughs> true is that Gianni Russo, the casting. I guess of Gianni Al Ruddy Russo, saying that's who he really was, not who he says, yeah. not who Gianni Russo says. Gianni he was. Russo was not an actor, as evidenced by the fact that Gianni Russo didn't go on to do, uh, at least I'm aware of, any other major movies. I don't. Gianni Russo was a mob associate He that, has appearances in two movies that I know. He has he has like two lines in the, the movie The Freshman with Marlon okay, Brando right. and Any Given Sunday. Okay, cool. so he played Carlo <laughs> Rizzi. He, he plays Carlo Rizzi, who uh, marries uh, Talia yeah. Shire's Connie Corleone. Uh, first scene of the movie, uh, the original one, they're getting married. And, um, you know, his Hello, casting Carlo. his casting 
was a a favor, if you will, to the mob uh, for permission to shoot this in these neighborhoods. Wasn't and that the, uh, Montana too? Luca and Brazzi? Ray Montana. Yeah, he's great. Both who of them was are Luca good in that movie. Who was Luca Brazzi? Brazzi. Yeah. Yeah. Who was also a professional wrestler? Who who was played in the offer by Lou Ferrigno? Oh, right. <laughs> Hulk, uh, not the Incredible Hulk. The Incredible Hulk. So, uh, you know, I think if people are aware that it's not a history book, uh, I think the offer gets it a lot better than Winning Time. Winning Time, you have people that are being depicted in that, like threatening. To sue, <laughs> yeah, they threat. make everyone look pretty bad. Uh, yeah. And 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 I know Jerry West, uh, the, the general manager of the team, who's one of the all time legends in the NBA, battled depression his whole life. Is NBA, he still alive? Yeah, the NBA logo is him. It is him, yeah. and he is talking about how the depiction of him in this series has turned his life upside down because they make him out to be the biggest asshole ever. <laughs> and it's like, did Jerry West have some attributes? That were accurately uh, depicted in that. Well, I yes, think that's, that's, was that his entire? Was that all? Was that a hundred percent of Jerry West? Absolutely not. You can't take ten percent of a human being and then do a uh, uh, something that's in the public eye and make that ten percent of the human being a hundred percent of the human being. Well, I think uh, the, the the in closing for me, the coolest thing about the offer is that it's on Paramount Plus, and then what you can what you can do is. All three Godfather movies are on Paramount+. Yeah. Plus. So as soon as you're done watching The Offer, I've talked to a lot of people that this is their first time. The Offer is getting them to watch, watch the, Godfather the Godfather movies for the first time. And I that's think that's good. excellent. That's good. And the, the Godfather movies on Paramount+, Plus are like the 4K versions. I'm so blown away by the look and the remastering. of, of Every time they do it... What, when it came out on DVD in 2001 or whatever, I thought this is the greatest thing ever. Yeah. Then they came out with the Blu-ray and I was blown away. Now this one's even better now. I saw and I, again I'm digressing here and we we've talked about this I'm sure with Roberto when we've brought the Godfather up but I just wanted to see a Godfather 4 so bad, which would have been, I know it was in the works, DiCaprio and Andy Garcia yeah. as kind of dueling Sonny Corleone. And that would have been the Returns book. Uh, it would have been going back and forth between the night, the late eighties and early nineties with Andy Garcia as the Godfather. Now, one thing I didn't know is and um, Leonardo I, DiCaprio I, playing Sonny. Yeah, which was in, in the pre, or was it? It was in development, wasn't yeah. it? I mean, there was yeah, there was some. It was yeah, it was in this magazine, and I actually I, I I've never I've never seen a copy, or I've never maybe I, I know you guys have probably read it or and have it, but I didn't I didn't know that there in nineteen eighty four this Mario Puzo wrote the Sicilian. Yeah, that's yeah. A, that's in that same universe. Is, is that a good book? My, uh it's okay, but I mean Michael Corleone is in it a lot, and so is uh, Clemenza, but um they're not the main characters in it. Oh. Um but uh it w one of the reasons why I think it's important to read it, it's kind of boring at times, but is um which actually, even even the novel, Godfather is one of the few examples where the film is a million novel. times better yeah. than, than than the novel. And the novel, is, you know, when when you I read the novel after I watched the films, and I remember reading it, I'm thinking like Michael Corleone wouldn't say that he wouldn't he wouldn't do that. Sonny wouldn't wouldn't say this. He wouldn't do that. But anyhow, uh, it is it is a good book to read just if you want more understanding of that universe because it it's what was what was going on with Michael while he was in Sicily, was in Sicily. stuff that you don't see. That you don't see in the film, and that stuff's that stuff's pretty cool. Yeah, like and, you know some of those connections and, and then a, things a, like that. A, another thing that it made me do is because you know I've seen all the Godfather movies a billion times, right? right? But it also got me into Coppola. So actually, in oh me too, I, I've watched on our all... show. On our show, I was made fun of, uh, and on Memorial Weekend, the Memorial conversation's Day, one of the greatest movies. Memorial ever. Day weekend was the first time I sat down, and I ever watched. Apocalypse oh, Now. Apocalypse Now is epic. Redo, I watched. Oh, that's, so that's the, like three. Redux, and a half. Redux. <laughs> yeah, that's that. It has the a lot outsiders, of extra footage. Is, the Outsiders is great. Yeah. But Apocalypse did, Now was a little crazy he for did, me. You know, he I, did I, a '90s I, movie. That's that a great that I, film. He did a '90s movie that I like, uh, The Rainmaker, with main, Matt Damon and uh, Mickey Rourke. I John Grisham book. I just know because I'm, you know, I'm a horror fan geek. So he did Bram and he Stoker's did what, Dracula he did, uh, and '92, which is really good. Okay, so that's what I want to. I want to end with this. If I'm not disparaging the fact that they made the offer. I, I think, like I said, I think it's it's high quality. It helps more than just, it hurts. Just so you know, just you know, there's a little context that's that's lost. Be aware, know your history if you want to know it, and just uh, consume it for what it is, which is a good story. But if you really wanted to make a 
fascinating, whether it be a scripted or an unscripted story of behind the scenes of a Coppola movie. It's what went down with Cotton Club between 1980, when that movie was first uh, got oh, yeah, off the ground the in development, and 1984. Uh, you had the mafia, you had gangland murders, you had the hustler Larry Flint empire, you had a, a Oscar-winning producer that was coked out of his mind, possibly putting murder contracts out on his ex-girlfriend, <laughs> as well as... Maybe that'll be the next series. As, as well as a uh, another uh, shady underworld figure that uh, ended up screwing him over, or screwing over the, rather, the, the, screwing over the girl, um, who was a female drug dealer that Robert Evans was dating, Sylvester Stallone, Richard Gere, Tony Spilatro, who was, you know, if you ever saw the movie Casino, that was the Nicky Santoro character, was, was Tony Spilatro. He was right in the middle of all the chaos behind the, the movie and The speaking, Cotton Club. Speaking of Stallone, I'm, in, I'm very excited for Tulsa, oh, for Tulsa King. King. The first time Stallone in my estimation has ever played a gangster. Well, he's played it in some... I think he did a comedy. He did a comedy. <laughs> uh, yeah, he, you know, he, he has never really... He doesn't play bad guys. Yeah, this will be good. So this was exciting. Uh, we're going to wrap it up. Thank you, Ben. Thank you, Roberto. Watch Anytime. us on YouTube. Follow us on social media. And, uh, you know, click, like, subscribe. We're going to get the, the YouTube up and running, hopefully at, by, by full steam by, by the end of the summer. We'll have a lot of content for you. We'll, hopefully we'll start doing some lives. Yeah. Uh, yeah, we've wanted to do that we'll for a while. We'll start uh, doing some more you know, interactive stuff, and uh, we'll get ourselves into the 21st century eventually. <laughs> and thanks for everyone's patience. I know it's been a few weeks since we dropped an episode, and it's really flattering that people are on social media like, hey, man, like you're killing me. Like, yeah. I look forward to this every week during my drive to work, and so we really appreciate that support. And and we're back. And uh, thanks again for listening. Uh, yeah, go ahead. OG Media. Yeah, actually, it's not OG Media. That that's eventually what what the the Empire will be called. But OG <laughs> Podcast. Yeah. Uh, in the building. Again, thanks, Roberto. Thanks, Ben. I'm Scott Bernstein for Jimmy Bucciolato. We're out. We'll see you next week.